Good evening. Um, welcome to the LSE. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be chairing the annual British Journal of Sociology lecture uh, for 2016. Um, a couple of announcements. First, afterwards, in the senior dining room, which is on the fifth floor, um, come and have a drink uh, on us um, <laughs> and with Alden. Um, and there's probably some peanuts or something like that. <laughs> uh, the BGS spares no expense. Uh, so they'll probably be very, very nice peanuts. Um, so that's straight afterwards. Um, now, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'm pleased to announce uh, the winner of the BJS Prize. This is awarded to an outstanding article published in the journal over a two-year period, in this instance running from... Uh, March 2014 issue to the December 2015 issue. And I'm delighted to say that this year's prize of £500 plus a year's personal subscription to the BGS, and that must be worth having, uh, goes to Robert Brim and his fellow authors for the article published in June 2014, Social Media in the 2011 Egyptian Uprising. Is Robert here? He is. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, using Gallup poll data, uh, the paper challenges received wisdom about the importance of social media in the 2011 Egyptian uprising. One reviewer praised the paper as a corrective to sweeping generalizations that have been repeatedly put forward in recent times regarding the role of social media in collective action processes, while another called it a neat statistical experiment. So it kind of covered all angles. Our feeling was that the paper lifts the lid on a relationship between social media and political action that is too often assumed and comes up with some contrary arguments based on careful and rigorous analysis. This is in many ways what sociologists need to be doing when questioning prevailing wisdom, particularly about such an important event. I would now uh, like to congratulate Robert, and I meant to have a prize for you, but I've left it somewhere, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you afterwards. But he's got the money, that's what really matters. <laughs> so congratulations, Robert. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? That's a great speech. That's the, one of the best speeches. Uh, if only everyone at the Oscars was, was like that. Uh, so now we come to the 2016 BJS Annual Lecture. This event has been running for more than a decade now with a series of distinguished speakers who have set out their own vision of the most significant questions and debates within their particular area of the discipline. Each lecture is published in the journal's subsequent March issue with a set of responses to it by other scholars within that field. One of the central aims of the lecture is to stimulate inquiry into the foundations and scope of the discipline and in this sense I can think of no more appropriate and important a speaker than Alden Morris. Alden is the Leon Forrest Professor of Sociology and African American Studies at Northwestern. He gained his PhD from SUNY in 1980, taking his first job at Michigan before moving to Northwestern in 1988. He is author of The Origins of the Civil Rights Movement, which won several prizes, including the Gustavus Myers Award, and editor of The Frontier of Social Movement Theory and Oppositional Consciousness. Throughout his career, Alden has taken a close interest in social activism and has said that he got into sociology because of this. I thought I could go to the university, study the laws of social change, and be an agent for it, he once said. But the more I studied, the more I learned just how little I actually knew about social change and inequality. His first book was a landmark study in the social movements field and was described in the New York Times as a benchmark study that sets the historical record straight. And setting the record straight is very much the focus of Alden Morris's latest book, The Scholar Denied, which was published last year. This book has had a tremendous impact on American sociology and it is beginning, just beginning, to detonate into the sociological community worldwide. The book focuses on W.E.B. Du Bois, focusing, arguing forcefully and persuasively 
for his foundational place in modern sociology. The first school of scientific sociology in the United States was founded by a black professor located in historically black university in the South, Morris states in the opening paragraph. The book's reception has been extremely positive. The LA Times states that the book should spur histories that give the work of the Bois and other marginalized scholars its rightful, meaningful place in the canon. While in the Berkeley Journal of Sociology journal, Julian Goh describes the book as a wake-up call about our own professional doxa, a reminder that the cost of the marginalization of a scholar such as Du Bois is not simply an ethical one, it is an epistemic one that sociology cannot afford. We are in the age of Du Bois, Alden states in The Scholar Denied. This is a massively important book which compels us to think deeply, not only about our own founders, but about the universalizing intellectual framework in which we think about our own disciplinary foundation. So please welcome Alden Morris to the LSE. Good evening. I am uh, very pleased to be here. Um, I come from a working class family. I didn't have anybody to go to college before me, so I knew very little about it. And when I was in undergrad school, a professor told me that I should apply for a PhD uh, program, and they, and he, suggested that I applied to the London School of Economics. And of course, you know, for me at the time, it was just too far away, and I doubted my chances of getting in anyway. And, uh, and so I've always uh, thought about LSE in a very fond way, and so it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here to, dis to, to discuss the ideas from my new book, the scholar denied. The clicker didn't work. Okay, we gotta work on getting this right. There it is. Okay. Okay, this is the next one. Okay, all right. So I am truly honored to present the 2016 British Journal of Sociology annual lecture. And I want to thank uh, Professor um, Nigel Dodd for inviting me to be here this evening and to uh, give me that wonderful um, introduction. I also want to thank Mrs. Uh, Jackwee Quanlet, Gunlet, for all of her efforts in planning this event. So in this lecture, I want to make three major arguments. First, I argue that W.B. Du Bois and his Atlanta School of Sociology pioneered scientific sociology in the United States. Second, I argue that Du Bois pioneered a public sociology that creatively and scientifically combined scholarship and activism. And finally, I will argue that Du Bois pioneered a politically engaged social science that was, that's very relevant to contemporary studies, including the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. So let me begin by stating that there is an intriguing, well-kept secret regarding the founding of sociology in America. As you've heard, the first school of American scientific sociology was founded by a black professor, located in a small, economically poor, and racially segregated black university. At the dawn of the 20th century, from 1898 to 1910, the black sociologist and activist W.B. Du Bois developed the first scientific school of sociology at this historic black university, Atlanta University. 
Now, I realize that this, it is a monumental claim to argue that Du Bois developed the first school of scientific sociology in America. However, my purpose in writing The Scholar Denied was to shift our understanding of the founding over 100 years ago of one of the social sciences in America. Current origin stories claim that white male scholars at prestigious white universities were the exclusive creator, creators of American scientific sociology. In this view, black social scientists and black universities were not even marginal contributors to the development of scientific sociology. Yet, these narratives are inaccurate because they fail to acknowledge, even mention to this day, the foundational role that Du Bois's Atlanta School played in pioneering scientific sociology. So then, in the scholar denied, I argue that if Du Bois's innovative ideas and methodologies have been placed at the center of sociology's founding intellectual frameworks, a century ago, they would have provided powerful theoretical and methodological directions for this new social science. The denial of Du Bois' scholarship impoverished sociology from its very beginnings. Thus, the scholar denied aims to shift our understanding of a slice of American social history. In so doing, my aim is to challenge paradigms, disrupt normal narratives, and to il illuminate new truths. So today, we take the social sciences for granted. But in historical time, they are recent. The social sciences arose in the last decades of the 1800s. The first department of sociology was founded at the University of Chicago in 1892. At that time, sociologists founded the American Journal of Sociology, which was the first national journal in the field. And then in, in 1905, the National Association of Sociologists, that is the American Sociological Society was organized. It's now the ASA, the American Sociological Association. Uh, back then, some sociologists had a problem with it being named the American Sociological Society, that is ASS. <laughs> American sociology, therefore, was the product of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. However, when early American sociology is scrutinized, it becomes clear that it was not very scientific. The early sociologists collected little empirical data to support their sociological treatises. And when we think of sociology today, we have in mind studies where surveys are administered, interviews conducted, field work undertaken, and quantitative and qualitative data are utilized to document and interpret the human condition. These empirical methodologies provide evidence enabling sociologists to test hypotheses and to seek valid uh, scientific conclusions. Today, the sociologists cannot simply say well, you know, my studies are valid because I have a doctorate from an elite institution like LSE, or that my opinions are accurate because they are based on my own deep thoughts. <laughs> In contemporary sociology, scholars must support theories with empirical data and make their data available to other scholars so that they can reach independent judgments regarding the scientific validity of these studies. Yet. This did not happen in early American sociology. Most sociology of that period was essentially social philosophy rather than so sociological science because it relied on deductive armchair theorizing or what Du Bois referred to as car window sociology, signifying that it was based on casual observations one made while gazing from the window of a fast moving train. So car window sociology was not rigorous science because it was based on hunches and rumors and travelogues and loosely formed opinions. 
Early American sociology had another enduring feature. It was racist. When sociology began taking shape at the turn of the 20th century, American racism was at its zenith. Jim Crow, Jim Crow racism had replaced the more liberal racism of the Reconstruction period. The, Reconstruct, the, the Jim Crow era, era ushered in sharecropping and a peonage debt system that replaced slave labor. Lynchings, where blacks were hung from trees, were commonplace, leading the great jazz artist Billie Holiday to sing sadly, Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. And then blacks were, st were stripped of the vote, starved economically, and treated as southern humans with no rights that white persons were bound to respect. These conditions caused ex-slaves to sing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. The ugly, this ugly racism presented America with a very fundamental challenge. How could a self-anointed democracy declaring, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, justify oppressing millions of black folk? How could America justify to itself in the world that racial oppression and democracy were congruent? While white America solved this embarrassing paradox by transferring the ideology of white supremacy that was born during slavery to the Jim Crow regime. That ideology claimed that blacks were an inferior race, more akin to chimp chimp chimpanzees rather than human beings. It insisted that blacks were subhuman who were infested with inferior D DNA and an inferior culture. So then blacks were framed as prisoners of racial inferiority who languished at the bottom of society because God planned it that way. So in the early 20th century, science gained momentum as the superior mode of reasoning in an age of enlightenment. But science prompted a thorny question. Namely, was it possible that a rigorous science of race would produce evidence discrediting the ideology of black inferiority? In other words, was the theory of white supremacy consistent with scientific facts? However, this clash between ideology and science never materialized. White American, white American scholars throughout academia, from the sciences to the humanities, biology to literature, and history to sociology, shared a solid consensus which claimed that science proved that blacks were inferior. Thus, in the early 20th century, white science and white supremacist ideology walked hand in hand justifying racial oppression. Nevertheless, a sure-footed challenge to the racist science was soon to be launched. In the last decade of the 19th century, W.B. Du Bois had become a confident, brilliant young black man who was convinced of his own genius. He was also convinced that God had not made black people inferior. In an age when whites view blacks as inferior, Du Bois' own achievements were jarringly and consistent with myths of black superiority. At age 20, Du Bois earned a bachelor's degree from Fisk University. By age 22, he had earned another bachelor's degree from Harvard. At age 23, he had earned a master's degree from Harvard. By age 25, Du Bois completed two years of advanced graduate studies at the University of Berlin in Germany. And at age 27, Du Bois became the first African-American to earn a, pre, a PhD from Harvard. And his doctoral dissertation, which was called the title, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to, to the United States of America, became the first volume that was published in Harvard's Historical Studies Series of 1896. 
Thus, Du Bois was one of the most educated persons in the world during the time that blacks were viewed as inferior. Indeed, his genius, advanced education, and supreme self-confidence prepared him to become a leading scholar who would launch an intellectual attack to overturn the lie that God made black people inferior. That lie, reason Du Bois had to be overturned if blacks were to break free of racial oppression. Yet Du Bois faced a great intellectual challenge. How was he to engineer the overthrow of scientific racism? Du Bois' scholarly preparations provided him an unshakable foundation to launch the attack. Through his, his historical and sociological studies, Du Bois uncovered severe intellectual weaknesses in the sciences. He knew that sociological knowledge of the period was based on racial biases, deeply rooted in the souls of white scholars. Insisting on a critical social science, Du Bois wrote, quote, most unfortunate is the fact that so much of the work done on the Negro question is notoriously uncritical. Uncritical from a lack of discrimination in the selection and weighing of evidence. Uncritical in choosing the proper point of view from which to study these problems. And finally, uncritical from the, from the distinct bias in the minds of so many writers, end quote. So then Du Bois recognized that this biased scholarship went, uh, went unchallenged by uh, white scholars because it was consistent with white supremacy that was supported by white elites. He knew that this science of race was not based on empirical facts but on conjecture and speculation. Du Bois was also aware that race scholarship emerged full-blown from the minds of white scholars who never exited their offices or libraries to conduct research. Thus, Du Bois' daunting challenge was to develop a new scientific theory that uncovered the actual causes of racial oppression. Therefore, Du Bois aspired to build a new sociology. You know, throughout the history, throughout history, there are only a few scholars who develop new scientific paradigms. Yet, here was this black scholar, trapped within the confines of intense racism, set out to discredit race, racist discourse that was masquerading as science. So that Du Bois's mission was clear, it was to inject science into a non-scientific sociology by conducting concrete studies among actual people, his people, a people who lived and died behind the veil of racism. Initially, Du Bois thought whites oppressed blacks because they were victims of ignorance who actually believed in the myth of white superiority. Du Bois argued that a scientific sociology would demonstrate that racism rather than black DNA caused racial inequality. So he declared, quote, the world was thinking wrong about race because it did not know. The ultimate evil was stupidity. Du Bois believed that a scientific sociology could liberate whites from this racist thinking and that it could also empower blacks because, quote, the problem was in my mind a matter of systematic investigation and intelligent understanding. Thus, Du Bois pledged to make the world think right about race by developing a scientific-based social science. In so doing, he parted company with his white sociological peers who unconsciously and sometimes consciously practiced a non-scientific sociology. Now, Du Bois was aware of the scientific errors that was committed by uh, white social science. First, their reasoning was not informed by history. Second, they did not use quantitative data to carefully measure social phenomena. Third, they failed to acquaint themselves intimately with people by living among them and observing their daily lives. Third, they failed to even interview people about their realities. Fourth, they failed to conduct empirical studies on the populations, the very populations that they analyzed. And fifth, and possibly worst of all, 
They substituted racist beliefs for sociological truths. In sharp contrast, Du Bois's sociology embraced the scientific method. Having earned his doctorate from Harvard in history, not sociology, they did not have a sociology department, Du Bois always anchored his sociology in history, reasoning that you could not understand people if you did not situate them in the appropriate historical context. So at the University of Berlin, Du Bois mastered quantitative research and ethnographic methods by conducting empirical research that was based in field work. So after completing his training in Germany, Du Bois, in his own words, dropped back into nigger hating America to conduct empirical studies on African Americans that boldly confronted scientific racism. Thus, referencing his scientific approach, du, du Bois challenged, critically challenged Carl Wendell's sociology. So for example, he scolded the prominent Cornell University economist Walter Wilcox, informing him, quote, the fundamental difficulty in your position is that you are trying to show an evaluation of the Negro problem only from inside of your office. It can never be done. If you must go on writing on this problem, why not study it, not from a car window, but get down here and really study it at first hand, end quote. So in contrast, Du Bois resided in communities he studied, where he interviewed and surveyed thousands of people. As a result of conducting numerous empirical studies, Du Bois developed a new scientific sociology of African Americans and of racial inequality. That new sociology introduced a number of innovations which I'm going to tick off to you. In terms of general theory, Du Bois theorized that modernity was a product of the African slave trade and centuries of slavery because they made available a labor force and crucial commodities that Western bourgeoisie here in England and elsewhere exploited to develop modern capitalism. Thus, race, like class, and status distinctions, argued Du Bois, was an important determinant of the development of capitalism. Du Bois theorized that the color line was a durable global structure of white supremacy that, un undergirded, that was undergirded by similar economic, political, and ideological forces worldwide. Race stratification therefore would shape the social world of the 20th century, according to Du Bois, so that race in this view were sociological, sociological creations rather than biological entities. The color line Du Bois famously predicted was, quote, the problem of the 20th century, and that problem is the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and in Africa, in America, and, this, and the islands of the sea. So I think it's important to point out here that Du Bois was not merely someone who studied race in America, but he was interested in the role of the color line globally as a structuring device of inequality. This theorizing inspired later predictions such as the one by Stuart Hall, who argued, quote, the capacity to live with difference is the common question of the 21st century, century, end quote. Like George Herbert Mead and Charles Cooley, Du Bois developed a theory of self-formation. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness theorized that the self, he theorized the self as a social product arising from social interaction and communications. Mead and Cooley had argued the same. However, Du Bois's conceptualization was theoretically innovative because he argued that self-formation was also uh, shaped by race and by power relations. Du Bois theorized that interactions among class, race, and gender had to be explicated in order to explain social inequality. So this theoretical emphasis anticipated the intersectionality paradigm and critical race theory. Finally, Du Bois theorized theorizing was based in an original standpoint theory, which privileged analysis from the viewpoint of the oppressed and the marginalized. 
His analysis of black inequality was based on a question directed at his people. And that question was, how does it feel to be a problem? Du Bois' scholarly, scholarly innovations regarding African Americans was this. He demonstrated that African Americans were the equals of other races because racial oppression rather than biological traits determined the social location of black people at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. It demonstrated that there was no such thing as black crime because social conditions and not racial characteristics produce crime. He demonstrated that the black community was heterogeneous, consisting of social classes and diverse experiences. It demonstrated that the church was the institution that served as a central organizing hub of the black community. Because of the church, black people were capable of liberating themselves through their own organizations and collective intelligence. So then, long before the Civil Rights Movement, Du Bois predicted that a black movement situated in the black church would arise to overthrow racial inequality. By the way, even in the late, in the mid-1950s, no white sociologist had any inkling that the Civil Rights Movement or the Black Power Movement were coming. Because if you view people and you theorize people to be inferior and not having organization and not having leadership, how can they have agency? At any rate, at any rate breaking from the accepted wisdom, Du Bois analyzed black agency through which black people themselves could change the course of their history. It also demonstrated the necessity of, of, of exploring blacks' inner subjectivity because racial oppression produced within blacks a double consciousness that was simultaneously oppressing and liberating. Thus, Du Bois created a new scientific sociology that was rigorous and emancipatory. Empirical studies, Du Bois and his Atlanta school produced numerous empirical studies using multi-methods, and he pioneered the novel technique of, of triangulation. Because these studies were conducted on rural and urban populations, Du Bois pioneered both rural and urban sociology. While the Chicago School is credited with founding urban sociology in the 1920s, Du Bois's 1899 Philadelphia's Negro was a masterpiece of urban sociology steeped in multiple empirical methodologies. Moreover, Du Bois was surely among the first social scientists to develop structural analysis of racial inequality and social inequality generally. Therefore, Du Bois emerged from his early scientific studies as the first number crunching, surveying, interviewing, participant observing, and field worker, and, and field working sociologists in America. Nevertheless, White sociologists ignored Du Bois's pioneering scholarship. In fact, Chicago school sociologists in the 1920s promoted themselves as the founders of empirical sociology and of race studies. This myth has existed up to this day because of the marginalization of Du Bois's scholarship. But in contrast, the German sociologist Max Weber studied Du Bois's scholarship and embraced his view that the problem of the 20th century was the global color line. Weber appreciated Du Bois' scholarship demonstrating that modernity sprung from race oppression as much as it did from class and status distinctions. Weber therefore concluded that Du Bois was a scholar with whom no American scholar could compare. Du Bois did not create this new scientific sociology alone unforgotten scholars and students heretofore erased from sociological history were crucial in developing Du Bois's Atlanta school. Du Bois' researchers included professional sociologists, undergraduate and graduate students, alumni of Atlanta University and other historically black colleges and universities in the United States, and it included researchers who were community leaders. By investing in liberation capital and forging into insurgent intellectual networks, 
They conducted field works in, in numerous communities where they were as likely to collect data on rural cotton pickers as they were on urban city slickers. A few examples will suffice. Monroe Work, who earned a master's degree in sociology from the University of Chicago in 1903 and became the first African American to publish in the American Journal of Sociology in 1900, became a prolific member of Du Bois's research team. He published numerous and important sociological studies. Richard R. Wright, Jr., the first African American to earn a doctorate in sociology at the University of Pennsylvania in 1911, also participated in Du Bois's research project and published pioneering sociological studies. Edmund Haynes, the first African American to earn a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University in 1912 and was a co-founder of the National Urban League, became a key member of Du Bois's team and published numerous social scientific studies. Then Du Bois's genius included the ability to collaborate with a team of talented researchers. They conducted research, presented it at conferences, wrote scholarly papers illuminating racial inequality. It was this cadre of researchers that constituted the Atlanta School of Sociology. Yet, these scholars have been erased from the collective memory of sociology. Now I'm going to turn to science and activism. A month before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, he reflected on the enormous contribution Du Bois made to sociology and to the black freedom struggle. In 1968, just a month before he was assassinated, King stated, quote, long before sociology was a science, Du Bois was pioneering in the field of social study of the Negro life, and he completed works on health, education, employment, urban conditions, and religion. This was at a time, argued King, when scientific inquiry of Negro life was so unbelievably neglected that only a single university, Atlanta University, in the entire nation had such a program. And it was funded with $5,000 a year. You probably recall that in the, about 1912, when uh, W.I. Thomas uh, was contemplating doing the study um, on the uh, Polish peasants, he received $50,000 for a half-baked pr proposal. And so here was Du Bois and his team doing an entire work, year's work of research on a $5,000 budget. So then um, King recognized that the modern civil rights movement inherited gifts bequeathed by Du Bois. While most scholars remain cloistered in the ivory tower, fearing political involvement contaminated uh, scholarship, Du Bois engaged in synthesizing science and activism. For him, the very purpose of science was to produce valid knowledge that would be useful to liber liberation struggles. Du Bois, together with activists of his day, developed a blueprint that made the modern civil rights movement possible. Du Bois insisted that people of color should engage ceaselessly to, in protest to overthrow white supremacy. So then, as Du Bois researched, studied, and wrote, he marched onto the battlefield, leading important movements for justice. King was aware of his debt to Du Bois. Quote, history had taught Du Bois it is not enough for people to be angry. The supreme task is to organize and unite people so that their anger becomes a transforming force. King regretted not having time to aid, engage in scholarship because of the man's place on him as a movement leader. Yet King admired Du Bois' ability to, to, ability to excel both in scholarship and activism. So then Du Bois, according to King, quote, soon realized that studies would never adequately be pursued, nor changes realized without mass involvement of Negroes. The scholar then became an organizer. King listed the numerous national and international liberation stu studies that Du Bois, uh, uh, movements that Du Bois was either founder or was a participant. 
King concluded at Du Bois alarm, quote, imperialists of all countries and disconcerted Negro moderates in America who were afraid of this restless, militant black genius, end quote. So regarding Du Bois, King wrote, quote, it was never possible to know where the scholar Du Bois ended and the organizer Du Bois began. The two qualities in him were a single, unified force. Quote. Thus, Du Bois provided new models for scholars wishing to understand and change the world. He proved it possible to be a first-ranked scholar and a prodigious activist. Beginning with Max Weber, sociologists have argued for a value-free sociology based on the grand assumption that biased science emerged when scholars failed to separate scientific work and political activism. Contemporary scholars devoted to the intersectionality paradigm and to standpoint theory have established, I think, the impossibility of separating science and politics. All scholarship, as Julian Goh has said, comes from somewhere. It is all, all of it is rooted in the experience and the social location of those who produce it. As a result, there are sociologists advocating a public sociology that's useful to liberation struggles. Michael Burroway has led this call, arguing that for sociology, sociology to remain relevant, it, it must return to its radical roots and provide critical analysis of, that illuminate power and human domination. Thus, claims that politically engaged scholarship automatically loses its objectivity should be rejected. A counter view is feasible and for some desirable. That is, subaltern sociologies seek to be more rigorous than status quo science, precisely because the stakes are so high for a science dedicated to social transformation. Long before sociologists called for a public sociology, Du Bois pioneered one that was scientific and politically engaged. Du Bois, therefore, 100 years ago, provided a challenge example how radical scholars can, change, can be change agents despite the clamoring voices of purists claiming that science and protest don't mix. Now, I want to turn finally to Du Bois and his relevancy for contemporary studies. Du Bois's example is relevant for contemporary movements, including the Black Lives Matter movement. Movements are usually propelled by young people, especially students. Indeed, most successful movements utilize young people because of their flexible schedules, energy, idealism, and innovative thinking. Not surprisingly, young black people played cru crucial roles in social justice movements of Du Bois's day. How did Du Bois respond to young black protesters? Did he advise them to follow the politics of respectability and protect their prospects for upward mobility? Or did he advise students to initiate protests attacking injustice head on? Du Bois' response to student protests in the 1920s at his alma mater, Fisk University, provides an example of his stance. At the time, Fisk's white university, Fayette McKenzie, engaged in a racially biased leadership. As a result, the ability of students and faculty, that is black students and faculty, to address racism was severely curtailed. Fisk students were to follow the dictates of Jim Crow racism. Nevertheless, these students broke rank and rebelled. Du Bois responded, quote, and here again, we are always actually or potentially saying hush to children and students. We are putting on the soft pedal. We are teaching them subterfuge and compromise. We are leading them around to back doors for fear that they shall express themselves. And yet whenever and wherever we do this, we are wrong, absolutely and eternally wrong. Unless we are willing to train our children to be cowards, to run like dogs when they are kicked, to whine and lick the hands that slaps them, we have got to teach them self-expression. 
and, and self-realization. So while black leaders rebuked student protests because white money flowing into fists would dry up, Du Bois thundered, dignity and self-expression were far more precious than basketfuls of white dollars. When Du Bois learned of additional student protests, he embraced the politics of disruption. Quote, and again for a second time, and with no advice nor instigation from without, the students rioted and struck. They pounded ash cans. They sang and they yelled and they broke windows. I thank God that they did. I thank God that the younger generation of black students have the guts to yell and fight when they are insulted, mocked, and oppressed. A spontaneous rebellion of young and hurt souls who refuse to submit to calculated and remorseless tyranny is a splendid and a heartening thing. So Du Bois, the Harvard man, renowned author, organizer of African people, and the leader of the NAACP, stood in solidarity with protest protesting students who yelled and who broke windows. Moreover, Du Bois encouraged radical protests because, because protesters were, were, quote, the real radical, the man who hits power in high places, while power, backed by unlimited wealth, hits it openly and between the eyes. You, you could go back one, right there. So he's saying this kind of protester is the real radical because they protest when they're hit by wealth openly in between the eyes. The black students talk face to face and not down at the big gate. God speed the breed. Now, I'm, hopefully you'll be happy. I'm reaching my conclusions. I would tell you that Growing up in the black church, when the pastor said he was reaching his conclusion, it meant that he was a third through his sermon. <laughs> so you all better bear with me. The time has arrived for university curricula, especially in sociology, to be infused with Du Bois's scholarship. Not to include Du Bois's corpus of work amounts to academic racism. In light of Du Bois's treatment in the academy, there are a number of questions to be asked. One. Are there important voices, past and present, around the globe that should be incorporated into the academy but are excluded because of discrimination and scarce resources? The, and the scholar denied, the scholar denied documents how Du Bois's scholarship was marginalized and erased from the history of sociology. Uh, Professor Seltzer and Heldar, in an article they called The Other, the Other Chicago School, document a similar fate for Hull House scholars, including Jane Addams and Florence Kelly, who made pivotal intellectual uh, contributions to, to modern sociology, but were erased from the discipline's history because of sexism. These erasures document the need for a critical and reflexive sociology that is forever diligent in ensuring that all scholarly voices will be considered rather than merely those of elite sociologists, mainstream elite sociologists. Two, to what extent are contemporary social sciences today driven by powerful elite interests, causing social scientists to investigate global, in causing social scientists not to investigate global inequalities affecting millions of people? Three, should elite institutions, LSE, help fund and nurture scholarship at institutions on the periphery of the prestige hierarchy around the globe. Fourth, what may scholars learn from insurgent schools in the social sciences across the world from oppressed communities? So then, for real this time, in conclusion, <laughs> it is time to vanish the myth that American scientific sociology was founded by a group of white sociologists, white male sociologists at the University of Chicago. These are our buddies that we were taught, did it all by, by themselves. <laughs> Finally, as Du Bois, the Du Bois Atlanta School of Sociology, go back. <laughs> Can you go back? Right there. 
So then the Du Bois Atlanta School of Sociology should be recognized as the founder and early contributors to modern scientific sociology. This is rather a different image, isn't it? Finally, as Du Bois proved, the false dichotomy proclaiming social science and activism as polar opposites should be rejected. By so doing, we can reestablish sociology as a powerful and rigorous field that excels in scientific scholarship, unleashing truths that empower the agency of those struggling to liberate humanity. Du Bois's legacy is one, is one of an enduring historical toolkit kit of scientific and activist ideals, fully capable of guiding contemporary social science and efforts to free humanity. And I thank you. something bad. Thank you, Alden, very, very much. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions from the audience. Uh, there's always a first question. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Sorry, can you wait for the microphone? Thank you. You do, you do. <laughs> Even though I've been we here 40 hear, years. So, but um, Really interesting, insightful. I wonder how well it goes down in America. <laughs> so, so you've talked about a few people who are saying things. I mean, I just think you know it's fabulous. I wonder how LSE will take this on board because uh, not so many students here. So, I'm just interesting the challenge of getting this, you know, both the um, into sociology, but love the idea that we are here as as scholar activists. So, how's that going down? <laughs> well, one of the things that I do want to say is that I'm very pleased that the British Journal of uh, Sociology uh, has decided to uh, invite me to give the lecture and then to publish it with commentary uh, in the Journal of uh, British Sociology. So I'm so, I, so, so I'm so I'm pleased about that. Um, the other thing is that uh, Martin Bomer is here. Uh, scholar of the, uh, the sociology of science and of the Chicago School in particular. And uh, he's also the editor of the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies. And he has done, uh, initiated a uh, symposium on the book with I think six commentators, including himself. And so I feel good that uh, the message and remarks and reflections of the scholarly diet is, uh, are being um, uh, dealt with internationally. Now back at home in America, um, so far, pretty good. Um, uh, I was telling Nigel, Nigel asked me, and I get this all the time, Nigel goes, so how did they react at Chicago? <laughs> So I gave a talk at the University of Chicago, and uh, I'd given many talks at, at, at Harvard and Princeton and other places, and I was really, I really prepared for Chicago. <laughs> I, and I, I went through uh, role playing of probably what I would be asked and all of that, and that I, was, I had to be ready. And to my surprise, they were the most tame, and constructive group of sociologists and students I had ever encountered. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 as I reflected on this, and by the way, they gave me critical, and they gave me you know, important critical feedback to help boost my argument. So I reflected on this later. I said, well, you know what? It's probably that uh, these people are 100 years removed from, from how Chicago acted back then. And they don't want to be mired in the muck 
of what their uh, ancestors did. And, and besides, uh, not sharing uh, their, their views. And so um, I think that they see it as an unfortunate, maybe a historical occurrence, um, and that it's good that we're going to critique it and understand and, and move forward. Uh, I think that um, uh, in America, um, there have been about 30-some reviews on, on the book. I would say that 90% of them have been very uh, positive. There are those, you know, who, who are diehards. They, they don't want to buy the idea that there's this guy Morris talking about uh, W.B. Du Bois should be canonized right alongside Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. And all I tell them is that I mean it and that I produce evidence that I think that really shows that this ought uh, to be the case. Uh, there are certainly many um, scholars uh, who are around who came from Chicago, who were educated at Chicago, and uh, some of them uh, don't completely like me um, talking in the ways that I do about Robert Park and some of the others. Uh, but, um, but, you know, my position is that read the book. I produce evidence, firsthand evidence of what I'm talking about. And so all I can say is, is that thus far, uh, I have uh, been uh, pleased with the critical response. And uh, growing up as an African American in the United States, I've always been prepared to deal with haters. Professor Morris, it's uh, amazing to see you here. I'm from Inglewood. And, oh, uh, my goodness. My, my goodness. man from Inglewood in Chicago. <laughs> and, Rough uh, neighborhood, ain't it? Ain't it can be. Ain't it. It's a glorious uh, one, too, though. Well, yes. They just put a whole food store in there. Did you no, know they that? didn't. Yes, they did. In Where? Inglewood, man. Where? Where is it, Kim? 63rd in Austin. Well, oh, OK. <laughs> We're through him off now. I have to process that. <laughs> um, I, I, Teaching here at university, I think, um, I mean, you might be surprised to know that the, the, the limited number of black academics, black, black associate professors, black, black professors, and, I, and I, I wonder, you know, and I know that there's a similar context in the U.S., True. but, but in, in trying to bring to light voices, uh, you know, you need that personal perspective, I think, on some levels. So, you know, I'm surprised when my colleagues are not aware of certain people like a Audre Lorde or Bell Hooks, or and 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 how do we sort of address that in in, in the context of the kind of absence of, of black voices in, in 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 higher education and and also the second part of that is um, in in the UK as well. There's a lot of changes happening in higher education, um, real kind of marketization of it, and and it's unfortunate because that's the very reason I, I didn't want to teach in the states and wanted to be here, uh, but it's looking more and more like America in terms of tuition fees. So as the tuition fees go up. Uh, the, the less black students I see. So it's also about the, the number of black students that are coming through um, university as well. So how do we address those gaps and, and still you know, sort of highlight these, these voices or, or work to get these voices prominence? That's an excellent question and truly a real challenge. Um, one of the things that I found uh, in academia is that as Frederick Douglass once said, Without struggle, there is no progress. And so every university that I've been associated with, directly and indirectly, I've been involved in uh, protest and struggle, uh, aim to bring in uh, the marginalized, because my view is, is that you cannot have an exciting, critical uh, discourse without having all voices on the, at the table. And I, I would say to you that it is possible, but highly unlikely, that a white scholar could have written the scholar denied. I, um, so I think that, first of all, there is the intellectual argument to be made that we are producing uh, inferior science and inferior insights without having people from all backgrounds at the table producing scholarship. So that's one thing that struggle remains very important. I think another thing is, is that you really should um, persuade your universities to bring in 
uh, marginalized scholars from all over the world to interact uh, with students and faculty. And by the way, I want to be clear about something. I'm not an essentialist. I do not believe that only black people can produce important information on black people or that women can produce important scholarship on, on women. Uh, and so there are many scholars then from various kinds of backgrounds uh, that can bring uh, light to bear uh, on these issues. However, I would argue that there is no substitute for bringing in scholars of color who have been marginalized and oppressed because they do have a unique set of experiences that inform uh, their scholarship and inform uh, their, 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 their thinking. Uh, also, I, I would say that uh, one of the things that I think we should be doing is that we ought to make sure, no matter who the professor is, we ought to make sure that the voices that have been uh, marginalized, Franz Fanon, C.L.R. James, Andrew Lloyd, Mary, Mary Julius Cooper, Ida B. Wells, we should make sure that these people are studied within the curricula. And that there is no, there's, that at one time, I, I, I argue in the book, at, at one time, uh, scholars in the academy did not study or write anything or teach anything on Du Bois because they didn't even know. They suffered from ignorance because the earlier generation of scholars did not know anything or, or ignore it. Uh, du Bois. My position now is, is that there's too much work being done on these scholars who've been marginalized. There's no more excuse for ignorance that these scholars have, are not incorporated into the discourse and into the scholarship. I think that we ought to be clear, and I say this to my white colleagues all the time, we should be clear that no group knows it all. No group can see every angle of vision, and that therefore then for white scholars to enhance their own scholarship, as Weber did from Du Bois, you need to have these voices in the curriculum, and you need to invite them to come and give talks and speeches and workshops, and indeed you need to be busy about trying to find them and nurture them and hire them. in the middle, so we, we yeah, you, you, and then, um, do you, can we use the mic, I think for the podcast, well, we won't pick up the question, sorry, <coughs> there's two of you there, so we can, thank, thank you very much, thank you very much, um, I wonder, uh, Professor, how you and many other sociologists who are here tonight feel about um, the threat to sociology and to uh, sociological theory and practice that exists in, at the moment and that is coming from every corner of the world of DNA studies. I, I particularly refer to what you said, you cannot understand people without studying them in their historical context yes. and Du Bois' theory about uh, uh, all this prejudice that is comes into the theorizing about uh, uh, s and then bringing about a so-called body of sociological evidence about people. And you said, you, uh, you, you, you finished by saying, for sociology to remain relevant, it must not lose its objectivity, it must not divert from its scientific analysis. And yet so much research around the globe from so-called brain surgeons, brain scientists, neuroscientists, who are challenging the theories of sociologists that people in Holland at the moment, next week there's a big debate about people have no free will. That's a so-called neurologist who wrote that, and wrote a book about it. And that DNA and people's DNA determine where they are and who they are. I wonder how you or other sociologists feel, feel about that threat from uh, brain studies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to a certain degree, I don't think that we ought to treat it as a threat. I think we should uh, confront it head on for the intellectual bankruptcy that much of it is. I think that we're at a stage now, all of, pretty much all the scientific studies show 
that race does not exist biologically, but that it is socially constructed. And that, and that therefore to try to anchor these analyses in DNA and as if there's some essential uh, biological characteristics that dictate or determine human behavior is just outmoded. What I, what I would do, I have colleagues, uh, colleagues like Dorothy Roberts and Ann Morning and uh, Alondra Nelson who studied this question that you're talking about, about the role of Troy Duster, who was a speaker here for you all, uh, who studied this kind of question about the role of DNA, or at least the arguments about its relevancy in, in social uh, behavior. One of the things that Ann Morning, Ann Morning makes, a point she makes, and it's a point I would definitely embrace. She says, to some degree, that social scientists and sociologists in particular they run from reading what the so-called hard scientists say, as if they can't understand them, and therefore see ground to them and so on. I think that it is uh, relatively easy to be caught up on the so-called natural sciences, talking about race and so on and so forth, and we should engage these kinds of arguments. We should engage these arguments in, uh, in, in our classes. Um, I teach a class on, uh, on race and society, and one of the first questions I ask of, of, I mean, most of my students are white. The first question I ask them is, how do you know you're white? What makes you white? And, and, and they say, let's really, no, let's really think about that. And then when they uh, start feeling a little bit on edge, I turn to my few students of color, I say, what makes you black? <laughs> right? And I, I think that uh, we should push hard on challenging these kinds of biological explanations. They're never gonna, they're never gonna cease because white supremacy is still very much alive and it is based on the notion that others are inferior. What else is it? It's based on that notion. And so that to a large degree, the ideological justification for white supremacy is based on this notion of the inferiority of others. And so I think that we have to constantly take this kind of uh, science, I, I don't have both hands, but <laughs> science, pseudoscience about human behavior, we need to take it on. And we need to read and be clear about what the arguments that are being made and to bring the, to, the, the relevant data to bear to discredit it. Thank you very much, Professor Alden. Um, I think you've, an you've answered my first question, actually, um, in the sense of obviously white supremacy still existing. Um, but my question to you was, you know, listening through your lecture, you know, there's a trilling thread of nothing seems to have changed from 1809 to date. What do you say to people of a younger generation who sit back and listen to you and say, why engage with all of this if nothing's going to change? What's, what do you well, say to them? Well, first of, first of all, I reject categorically and fundamentally that nothing has changed. Uh, I remind uh, 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 students and, uh, and uh, scholars in the academy that black people and some other people of color only came to play a role in predominantly white universities in the late 1960s. And this is because of the protests and the struggles that took place in the 60s and the 70s, where students and faculty uh, took over administration buildings, and where they protested and had strikes and disrupted classes and so forth. And that this was the way we got uh, African American studies. This was the way we got women's studies. At my own university, the Asian American students went on strike because they, they, we didn't have Asian American studies. They went on a hunger strike. And so those things, those kinds of struggles have changed the academy some. And that there are voices in the academy that have never been there in any significant numbers before. And that is bringing, it on a, uh, bringing about some changes. I argue that it's a Du Bois moment because there's so many young scholars now who are working on Du Bois. There's gonna be a lot of scholarship coming out on some of these uh, uh, voices that have been denied. I also must say that, um, uh, I always try to do this because I can be on good terms later, 
But my younger daughter, Kamari, is in the audience. And when I did, I did my dedication page uh, to this book, I said I dedicate this book to my uh, mother and my grandparents. And, uh, and I was happy about that. And she said, well, but Daddy, you know, you talk about scholars who've been denied. And she said, <laughs> she said perhaps there have been scholars denied all over the world and through time. And I said, doggone, you're right. And, uh, and therefore, part of the dedication is to all of the scholars who have been denied based on some form of discrimin discrimination and marginalization. And uh, so, um, let me see. I kind of drifted a little bit there, Kamari. <laughs> now, what? Yeah, right, 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 exactly. Thank you so much. So, um, I, uh, so, I, so, I, so I think that there is some change in bringing in uh, marginalized uh, voices. I think that there, are, there have been societal changes uh, that are very important. In many ways, do you know that when trouble is afoot in society, it tends to be good for social science. And sociologists, it makes us study things anew and see things differently. And there is a kind of radical thinking that is going on in America, and I think beyond America, because of the Black Lives Matter movement. And because of all of these different movements that's challenging uh, inequality and challenging white supremacy. And one of the most important things that can easily be overlooked, if you watch the news on television, like you know, CNN and other places, and if you watch the protests and all, there are large numbers of white people who are involved in those protests and who want change. And I think that on the one hand, we got to continue to understand that coalition building is very important. It's tough work, and it's very important. So that what I would say is that we, by participating and recognizing the importance of protests outside of the academy, what we're really doing is bringing in new insights. One of the reasons why I like participating in activism and protests is because not that I can go and bring knowledge to them and tell them what to do, it's because of all the stuff I learned from being out there with them. And so that, so that, so that, so that protests and all fertilizes thought. So I think finally what I would say is that challenge uh, young people who claim that nothing has changed because that's a demoralizing point of view. Not only is it demoralizing, uh, but it is, it is uh, very much uh, uh, false in many ways. That is not to say that we now live in a post-racial world. That is not to say that racial hierarchies are not structured deeply into the fabric of the world. It's not to say that at all. But it is to recognize that you need, you know that movements and change grow from optimism, not from a lack of hope, not from frustration, but the belief on people's part that what they do can matter, that their own agency matter. And so that's why I would, I would just say that, you know, let's not uh, calmly accept this view from young people that, um, that nothing has happened. And also to remember, now that I'm uh, slightly older, <laughs> that I realize when I talk with these young people, I go like, damn it, that's the way I was. It's, 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 it's part of being young. It's part of being part of the young generation is to reject that which went before you because, you know, you think that you know every damn thing, right? And so the young people have to be challenged. And, and, and I think it's a good thing to challenge them, but also it's a good thing that they reverse it and challenge us. Okay. Thank you very much for your fabulous lecture. Um, and I think the question I'm going to ask has been partly answered already and asked as well. Um, because we talk about teenagers, do you provide any mini lectures for those that are not graduates, for those that are in secondary school? or high school, as you say, in America, because I feel that they need to know about the um, black sociologists from young, younger than the degree level rather than, um, yeah, 
so that they're able to actually study sociology at a degree level. So I was just wondering whether you do how, um, provide many lectures for them. In, 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 in all honesty, uh, I do far too little of that. Uh, one of the things about academia, as Louis Coza once talked about certain kinds of institutions that he called greedy institutions, and academia is greedy. Uh, you know, everybody want to know, what have you done for me lately? What have you published yesterday? And what's coming out tomorrow, right? And then all of the students, uh, you know, on uh, the, you know, that I work with and on dissertation committees and coming to places like LSE and all of that, I find very little time to do exactly what you're, you're talking about. But I think that it is critical. I, 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 I look forward to in the not too distant future of like um, lecturing in uh, the prisons uh, in the United States. I'm a product of a community college where uh, in Chicago where many of the students there are first generation college students, just like I was. And I, I've, I've thought about it, talked with my wife about it not too long ago that, you know, I, I'm gonna need in, in my so-called retirement to go back to places like that and, and teach courses and so on. Uh, and so I feel in, in many ways quite guilty uh, for not uh, uh, spreading the word, so to speak, to the marginalized to the extent that I think that I should be. Because you know it's really interesting. This is my own self-critique. It's really interesting. My first job was at the University of Michigan, a very elite school in the United States. My second job is at Northwestern, pretty much as elitist or certainly aspiring to be. And what that means is, is that I largely teach generations of middle to upper class white students year after year after year. And, uh, and I think about that sometime and say, well, you know, is that really largely your calling? Because I do think it's an interesting thing to do and a productive thing to do. But I think that yes, uh, it's very important for us to get outside of the walls of elite academia and, and talk with uh, People. I do have a, um, a New Year's party where my, 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 my daughters have really organized it and a lot of people from their generation come over and they get drunk and we talk <laughs> and we get very critical. And, uh, and I, I find that, uh, that as I get drunk with them, we talk about a lot of things that we otherwise wouldn't be talking about. Two of you in the same row, so. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then you'll have to. Sound check. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, Professor Morris, thank you very much for the lecture. And for those of you who haven't read the book, this is, uh, this is a question, but I'll make a comment too. Mainly because this is one of the few times I get to speak my, my mother tongue. I'm, I'm from Norway, but I'm a teacher too. Uh, the question is, I think in your book, when you show Robert Park contra Du Bois, there's very clearly, it's a political policy question involved in what I think is Park's erasure of and marginalization of Du Bois. But now I'm going to be a, a bit of a teacher because there there's an ideological element in it. It's a very clear racist element. I was trained in American sociology and I learned the myth that it all began in 1920 at the University of Chicago. From 1921 up to the 1950s, every student in introductory sociology at the University of Chicago read, had to read, I think they call it the Green Book. Green Bible, yes. The Green Bible. And in the Green Bible, written, it's edited by Robert Park and Ernest Burgess. Yes. Now I want you to imagine being a person of color. In a minute I'll get a person of color and a woman. On page, this is Park, on page 136 of this book, 30 years introducing sociology. I quote, the temperament of the Negro, as I conceive of it, 
consists in a few elementary characteristics determined by physical organi organizations and transmitted biologically. These characteristics manifest themselves in a genial, sunny, and social disposition, in an interest and attachment to external physical things rather than subject states and objects of introspection, in a disposition for expression rather than enterprise and action. Now, just so you don't think this was a one-time event, in soccer here, we talk about a hat trick. You get three goals. This is also Park. Man has got what he wanted by tackling things, going at them directly. The Negro and the woman has got them by manipulating the individual in control. And finally, the most infamous quote from Park. The American Negro, by natural disposition, neither an intellectual or idealist like the Jew, nor a brooding introspective like the East Indian, nor a pioneer and a frontiersman like the Anglo-Saxon. He is primarily an artist, loving life for its own sake. His mutier is expression rather than action. He is, so to speak, the lady among the races. Uh, yes, uh, those, uh, <laughs> those passages that he read, uh, I pretty much have committed them to memory. Um, I, um, of course, uh, don't take well to being thought of, nor are my people thought of as inferior. And certainly, uh, Park is making an argument about black inferiority. Uh, you, that, those statements, of course, were it was not uh, uh, appreciative of women either. So there is uh, sexism involved as, as well. But what I want to say is that what I, what I think we have to realize is that in the, in the book, um, there is a kind of drama and tension there between Robert Park and the role he played in the marginalization of Du Bois. But I think that we would lose sight if we think that this was an individual kind of thing by Robert Park. That the same kind of uh, thinking and even more, Park was in fact a, a sort of academic liberal during that period. But if you go to Columbia, you go to Columbia where Giddens, Giddens was the premier scholar at Columbia, considered one of the founders, founders of American sociology. I mean, you know, he, uh, he, he outright, uh, he was a, he was a card-carrying member of the Eugenics Society. Uh, he taught many students uh, like Odom and others who went on to be professors at, in race at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And, and they um, uh, preached this kind of uh, racist scholarship as well. And so uh, you could go to Harvard, you could go to Yale, you could go to Princeton, as I argued in the lecture. This was a consensus about black people, not only by scholars, but it was the same consensus that existed in the larger society. So I think that what, we, what, what is important is to still understand that Park, Parks is, uh, racism or racist views uh, were anchored in institutional structures and beliefs and power relations. And that if we don't think like sociologists and to study those power relations and the relationship between those power, power relations and the production of knowledge, then we'll, we will be uh, really missing something uh, that is important. But yes, another thing that I was struck by as I studied this for the book is that I, I was really struck by um, the number of founders of modern sociology in America who were members of the Eugenics Society, card-carrying members of the Eugenics Society. Uh, 
uh, I was looking out there at, at Martin Bormer. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I'm sure you must know uh, that uh, history as well as I do, if not, if not better. And so then the question I think is, is that to what degree can scholars really transcend the stereotypes and the racism and the limited views that exist in the society at large? To what degree are they, they mirrors of the society as opposed to being leaders that reflect alt alternate points of view and so forth so that members of society can absor absorb them? And what I can say is that in America it's been too bad that for most of our history is that scholars have not risen far above the racism of the society, the sexism of the society, and the homophobia of society. And that is, uh, going back to the question, has there been any change? I think that therein lies a lot of room for us to push for uh, more changes in those areas. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering whether you had had a a better reaction from, let's say, um, historical black colleges, and, and whether you have spoken at these colleges, with Morehouse, Howard? Um, interesting. Uh, I will say that the majority of the real negative reviews I've gotten have come from African American scholars. Uh, now, I don't want to uh, give the impression that that's the majority, because it's not. Uh, but the, 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 there has been, it's very surprised to me uh, about the, the, the nature of the reviews um, from some black scholars. This even has, have an ad hominem kind of effect. And I'm not really sure of that, and I, I was somewhat surprised by it. To get to the meat of your question is that um, I and I, I, I'm going to have to do this on my own, but I have not really spoken at very many historically black colleges, uh, universities, and colleges in the United States. I, I have not been invited to do so, uh, but I think that largely it's because many of these institutions are really struggling financially. And they think that somebody like Alden Morris is going to charge them a bunch of money to come and speak. So I'm going to tell them to look and see what the honorary is the LSE gave me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but on, a, on a serious side, <laughs> no, they're they, 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 they going to publish me in the British Journal of Sociology. I was too embarrassed to ask for an honorary. So... Um, so what I, what, I, what I need to do is to get the message out that I want to come and speak at those places and I will do so for free. And so I'm going to, to, to do that. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, you know, the book has been out a year. And so it's kind of early in the process. But your question reminds me once again that I need to be more cognizant of uh, how, once again, that elite universities with a lot of resources and all can get your attention and give you invitations and so, so forth, whereas others might not be able to readily do so. And so I myself will need to bridge the gap. if you can just be quite fast and is it okay if I go around? So we'll go around, we'll start there uh, and then we'll work our way back if that's okay. Oh, you've got the mic already, then we'll go around. <laughs> Sorry, you're ahead of me. All right. You don't uh, need me. <laughs> We're not paying you anyway. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about uh, this idea of objectivity. And so, uh, of an interpretation of what you just said, all of it, in some ways, is uh, uh, that W.E.B. Du Bois is critiquing white objectivity as a sort of um, entrenchment or the ways in which they use it, they, it, it and reinforces white supremacy. But then again, that sort of lets objectivity off the hook 
in some ways, right? As if like this is the answer and this is the go-to uh, way, uh, go-to uh, place or critique or mode of critique in order to um, understand inequality and solve for it. And so I just wonder if you could speak to that idea of escaping that problem of objectivity as a uh, go-to answer where like you, you're a person that exists in the world that uh, is affected by those structures and the relations that those power structures create. And that's really what, for me, W.E. Du Bois is doing, which is brilliant, but again, it's sort of. Yes, uh, well, when Professor Seltzer read to you what Robert Park had to say about black people, he claimed that you had to be totally objective and that he and, uh, and his colleagues at Chicago and elsewhere we were engaging in objectivity and that all of the do-gooders who wanted to change and wanted to push for, uh, for radical ideas in the academy that they, were, they, they just created a bad name for science because they weren't doing science. And so Du Bois in many ways was, was labeled a propagandist rather than a social scientist. But I think that you know, my, my counter to all of this is, is that I, as I argued in the lecture, is that uh, subaltern scholars or scholars from marginalized populations who want change is that they care deeply about objectivity, if by that we mean trying to get it right. And so the other thing that I, that I say is that uh, on the one hand, we could argue that Max Weber pushed the idea of a value-free sociology, but if you, if, you, if you read into his sociology deeply, you will see that it's very value-laden. You will also see that here is Karl Marx. I'm gonna get over to Highgate Cemetery while I'm here, but here is, but not, to, but not to rebury Marx, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, here is someone whose whole corpus of scholarship is based on the idea of transforming the world and, and liberating humanity and that it produced so many insights that we've been spilling ink and fighting over it ever since. And so that he, he, he was driven, he and Engels and others were driven by the need to get it right, to try to bring about change and to liberate humanity. That's the kind of objectivity that Du Bois was pushing. He made it clear, he had, he had, he had, he had very little um, time for anybody who wanted just to make arguments just based on um, the need for change or whatever, but he felt that to do uh, powerful, rigorous scholarship that could be tested by others and so forth is the kind that would generate reform and social change, not one that was sloppy and uh, uncritical. And so I think that, you know, my, my position is, is that we need to be very leery of the whole idea of those who are pushing objectivity as something in and of itself, something sui generis of itself. And because once we <coughs> truly deconstruct the knowledge by those who claim that they were objective and that their views came from nowhere but, but, but on the Mount Olympus of, of scholarship, we discover something entirely different. We discover agendas being pushed, right? So that's the, the, the and, you know, and I, and I think it's very important to, to, to talk to young scholars about this because they are in a position where they're trying to make their way and they can get, uh, um, I don't know what the word, brainwashed into believing that there's some sort of pure objectivity and that they need to push toward it and then convince themselves at some point that they really have reached the mountaintop of it, right? That's, I think that's the tragedy. I'm afraid one more, unless uh, we're, we're behind anyway, so no questions. Well, I just want to say first, maybe on behalf of many of us here, that it's an absolute privilege and pleasure to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, my question, if you could perhaps address it, is uh, given the excessive need, or really the genuine need for protest, how do you square that with the excessive, extraordinary militarization we're seeing now? Militarization. Oh, militarization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's becoming uh, rather difficult, to say the least, <laughs> to express the, g alongside the Patriot Act. I mean, put all of it together. And um, there's not much uh, resort uh, or resource to outwit 
those you know, governments. They're after us one way or the other. Well, um, militarization and state oppression aren't new. They've always, they've, they've always been around. It's always been around. The role of the state is to maintain the status quo. And as Weber argued, that the state can be defined as an institution that has a monopoly over the <laughs> legitimate use of force and violence. Um, so what I'm saying here is that you are absolutely right in the increased militarization uh, that's going on in the United States now um, because of the so-called drug wars uh, starting with, uh, Reg with uh, Nixon and then Reagan and then Clinton. Uh, they, uh, they and, um, oh, and, and of course, let me not leave Georgie out. <laughs> um, that uh, that uh, they gave the local police forces all of these military style uh, equipment, tanks and uh, all kinds of uh, 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 weapons that's used in war to, that's being brought out now against protesters, against police brutality and, 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 and social inequality in the United States. I completely resonate with you ab about the increased militarization. But I would argue that that increased militarization only says to those who want change that you must continue, you must intensify, you must become more innovative and, 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 and outthink the, the, the forces of the, of the state. And I would just end by saying, what must the state oppression have looked like to the slaves? And yet, they didn't lose hope. They found ways to counter it through an underground railroad and through uh, slave rebellions like that of Nat Turner. And so I, I think that there's always this complicated interactive relationship between the state and repression and the military and for all of those who would struggle because they want to be free. <laughs>